Good morning, brothers and sisters. Today we are going to look at grace. The term radical grace has been coined, and its champions say that God will never be angry with us no matter what we do or how badly we mess up. This has become the gospel message that has gone out to the masses. And with all things, we have the duty to search the scriptures to find out if these things line up. So we're going to begin in 1 Peter 3 through 5. And it says, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. By his great mercy, he has given us new birth into a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead and into an inheritance that is imperishable, undefiled, and unfading, reserved in heaven for you who through faith are shielded by God's power for the salvation that is ready to be revealed in the last time. Verse 8 through 11 says, Though you have not seen him, you love him. And though you do not see him now, you believe in him and rejoice with an inexpressible and glorious joy, now that you are receiving the goal of your faith, the salvation of your souls. Concerning this salvation, The prophets who foretold the grace to come to you searched and investigated carefully, trying to determine the time and setting to which the Spirit of Christ in them was pointing when he predicted the sufferings of Christ and the glories to follow. In 2 Peter 1, 16-19 it says, For we did not follow cleverly devised fables when we made known to you the power and coming of our Lord Jesus Christ, But we were eyewitnesses of his majesty, for he received honor and glory from God the Father when the voice came to him from the majestic glory, saying, This is my Son, in whom I am am well pleased. And we ourselves heard this voice from heaven when we were with him on the holy mountain. We also have the word of the prophets as confirmed beyond doubt, and you would do well to pay attention to it as a lamp shining in a dark place, until the day dawns and the morning star rises in your hearts. Acts 3, 18 through 26 says, But in this way God has fulfilled what he foretold through all the prophets, saying that his Christ would suffer. Repent, then and turn back, so that your sins may be wiped out, that the times of refreshing may come from the presence of the Lord and that he may send Jesus the Christ, who has been appointed for you. Heaven must take him until the time comes for the restoration of all things, which God announced long ago through his prophets, his holy prophets. For Moses said, The Lord your God will raise up for you a prophet like me among your brothers. You must listen to him and everything he tells you. Everyone who does not listen to him will be completely cut off from among his people. That's a repeat of Deuteronomy 18, 15 through 18. Indeed, all the prophets from Samuel on, as many have spoken, have proclaimed these days. And you are the sons of the prophets and of the covenant God made with your fathers when he said to Abraham, through your offspring, all the families of the earth will be blessed. When God raised up his servant, he sent him first to you to bless you by turning each of you from your wicked ways. And that is in Genesis 18:18 18, 18 and 22:18. So we have three different places that tell us the, that uh, the prophets, starting in Samuel going forward, spoke about the grace to come through Christ. Now there are others, but for the sake of time, I have I've listed these three. So we have to look at the prophets and what they wrote in order to understand grace. So I have provided some examples of us to read. I mean, this is not an exhaustive list of all of the prophecies, but it's a place to start so that you can start to look into these things yourself. Isaiah 1, 18 through 20 says, Come now, let us reason together, says the Lord. Though your sins are like scarlet, they will be as white as snow. Though they are as red as crimson, they will become like wool. If you are willing and obedient, you will eat the best of the land. 
But if you resist and rebel, you will be devoured by the sword, for the mouth of the Lord has spoken. Isaiah 4, 2-4 says, On that day the branch of the Lord will be glorious, beautiful and glorious, and the fruit of the land will be the pride and glory of Israel's survivors. Whoever remains in Zion and whoever is left in Jerusalem will be called holy. All in Jerusalem who are recorded among the living, when the Lord has washed away the filth of the daughters of Zion and cleaned the blood stains from the heart of Jerusalem by a spirit of judgment and a spirit of fire. That's in Revelation twenty two fourteen through fifteen. Isaiah eleven one through five says, "Then a shoot will spring up from the stump of Jesse, and a branch from his roots will bear fruit. The spirit of the Lord will rest on him, the spirit of wisdom and understanding, the spirit of counsel and strength, the spirit of the knowledge and the fear of the Lord, and he will delight in the fear of the Lord." He will not judge by what his eyes see, and he will not decide by what his ears hear. But with righteousness he will judge the poor, and with equity he will decide for the lowly of the earth. He will strike the earth with the rod of his mouth, and slay the wicked with the breath of his lips. Righteousness will be the belt around his hips, and faithfulness the sash around his waist. And we can read about that in Revelation 19, 11 through 16. Isaiah 11:10 through 12 says on that day the root of Jesse will stand as a banner for all peoples the nations will seek him and his place of rest will be glorious on that day the lord will extend his hand a second time to recover the remnant of his people from assyria from egypt from pathros from cush from elam from shinar which is babylon from hamath and from the islands of the sea He will raise a banner for all for the nations and gather the exiles of Israel. He will collect the scattered of Judah from the four corners of the earth. And you can read about that in John 11, 49 through 52. In Isaiah 22, 21 through 22, it says, I will clothe him with your robe and tie your sash around him. I will put your authority in his hand, and he will be like a father to the dwellers of Jerusalem and to the house of Judah. I will place on his shoulder the key to the house of David. What he opens, no one can shut, and what he shuts, no one can open. You can read about that in Revelation 3, 7 through 13. Isaiah 25, 6 through 9 says, On this mountain, the Lord of hosts will prepare a banquet for all the peoples. A feast of aged wine, of choice meat, of finely aged wine. On this mountain he will swallow up the shrouds that enfolds all people, the sheet that covers all nations. He will swallow up death forever. The Lord God will wipe away the tears from every face and remove the disgrace of his people from the whole earth. For the Lord has spoken, and in that day it will be said, Surely this is our God. We have waited for him, and he has saved us. This is the Lord for whom we have waited. Let us rejoice and be glad in his salvation. You can read about that in Revelation 19, 1 through 9, and Revelation 21, 3 through 4. Isaiah 28, 16 through 19 says, So this is what the Lord God says. See, I lay in a stone in Zion a tested stone, a precious cornerstone, a sure foundation. The one who believes will never be shaken, repeated in Romans 9.33. I will make justice the measuring line and righteousness the level. Hail will sweep away your refuge of lies, and water will flood your hiding place. Your covenant with death will be dissolved, and your agreement with Sheol will not stand. When the overwhelming scourge passes through, you will be trampled by it. As often as it passes through, it will carry you away. It will sweep through morning after morning, by day and by night. The understanding of this message will bring sheer terror. Isaiah 40, 1 through 8 says, Comfort, comfort my people, says your God. Speak tenderly to Jerusalem and proclaim to her that her forced labor has been completed. Her iniquity has been pardoned. 
for she has received from the hand of the Lord double for all her sins. Read that in Revelation 18, 4 through 6. A voice of one calling, prepare the way for the Lord in the wilderness. Make a straight highway for our God in the desert. You can read about that, Matthew 3, 1 through 2, Mark 1, 1 through 8, Luke 3, 1 through 20. Every valley shall be lifted up, and every mountain and hill made low. The uneven ground will become smooth, and the rugged land a plain. And the glory of the Lord will be revealed, and all humanity will come together, will see it. For the mouth of the Lord is spoken. A voice says, Cry out! And I asked, What should I cry out? All flesh is like grass, and all its glory like the flowers of the field. The grass withers, and the flowers fall when the breath of the Lord blows on them. Indeed, the people are grass. The grass withers, and the flowers fall, but the word of God stands forever. That's also repeated in 1 Peter 1, 13-25. Go up on a high mountain, O Zion, herald of good news. Raise your voice loudly, O Jerusalem, herald of good news. Lift it up and do not be afraid. Say to the cities of Judah, Here is your God. Behold, the Lord comes with might, and his arm establishes his rule. His reward is with him, and his recompense accompanies him. That's repeated in Matthew sixteen twenty seven, Revelation two twenty three, eleven seventeen through eighteen, fifteen three through four, sixteen five through six, twenty twelve, and twenty two twelve. Isaiah forty nine one through three says, "Listen to me, O islands; pay attention, O distant peoples. The Lord called me from the womb." From the body of my mother he named me. He made my mouth like a sharp sword. He hid me in the shadows of his hand. He has made me like a polished arrow. He hid me in his quiver. He said to me, You are my servant, Israel, in whom I will display my glory. In verse 6 it says, He says, It is not enough for you to be my servant, to raise up the tribes of Jacob, and to restore the protected ones of Israel. I will also make you a light for the nations, to bring my salvation to the ends of the earth. Verse 8 through 10 says, In the time of favor I will answer you, and in the day of salvation I will help you. I will keep you and appoint you to be a covenant for the people, to restore the land, to appoint, I mean, a portion, excuse me, its desolate inheritances, to say to the prisoners, Come out! And to those in darkness, show yourselves. They will feed along the pathways and find pasture on every barren hill. They will not hunger or thirst, nor will scorching heat or sun beat down on them. For he who has compassion on them will guide them and lead them beside springs of waters. Repeated in Revelation 7.16. Isaiah 55, 1-7 says, Come, all you who are thirsty, come to the waters, and you without money, come, buy, and eat. Also repeated, John 4.14, 4, Revelation 21.6, and 22.17. Come, buy wine and milk without money and without cost. Why spend money on that which is not bread, and your labor on that which does not satisfy? Listen carefully to me and eat what is good, and your soul will delight in the richest of foods. Incline your ear and come to me. Listen so that your soul may live. I will make with you an everlasting covenant, my loving devotion promised to David. Behold, I have made him a witness to the nations a leader and commander of the peoples. Surely you will summon a nation you do not know, and nations who you do not know will run to you. For the Lord your God, the Holy One of Israel, has bestowed glory on you. Seek the Lord while he may be found. Call on him while he is near. Let the wicked man forsake his own way and the unrighteous man his own thoughts. Let him return to the Lord, that he may have compassion 
and to our God, for he will freely pardon. Isaiah 62, 11 says, Behold, the Lord has proclaimed to the ends of the earth, Say to the daughter of Zion, See, your Savior comes. Look, his reward is with him, and his recompense goes before him. Jeremiah 31, 31 through 34 says, This is the covenant that I will make with them after those days, declares the Lord. I will put my laws in their hearts and inscribe them on their minds. Then he adds, Their sins and their lawless acts I will remember no more. Repeated in Hebrews 10, 15 through 17. Ezekiel 12, 1 through 3 says, This is the burden of the, of the word of the Lord concerning Israel. Thus declares the Lord who stretches out the heavens and lays the foundation of the earth, who forms the spirit of a man within him. <clears throat> Behold, I will make Jerusalem a cup of drunkenness to all the surrounding peoples. Judah will be besieged as well as Jerusalem. On that day when all the nations of the earth gather against her, I will make Jerusalem a heavy stone for all the peoples. All who would heave it away will be severely injured. And we read in Revelation 14, 8, Then a second angel followed, saying, Fallen, fallen is Babylon the great, who has made all the nations drink the wine of the passion of her immorality. Luke 21, 20 through 24 says, But when you see Jerusalem surrounded by her enemies, you will know that her desolation is near. Then let those who are in Judea flee to the mountains. Let those in the city get out, and let those who are in the country stay out of the city. For these are the days of the vengeance, to fulfill all that is written. How miserable those days will be for pregnant and nursing mothers. For there will be great distress upon the land, and wrath against this people. They will fall by the edge of the sword, and be led captive into all the nations. And Jerusalem will be trotted down by the nations, until the times of the nations are fulfilled. Now before this, in Luke 20, Jesus said, Jesus looked directly at them and said, This is what the meaning of that which is written. The stone the builders rejected has become the cornerstone. Everyone who falls on this stone will be broken to pieces, but he on whom it falls will be crushed. He is the heavy stone for all peoples. The one whom, if heaved away, will be severely injured. He spoke the parable of the vineyard and the wicked tenants who killed the servants of the prophets sent to them. And they, they finally speak of killing the heir, which is speaking of his own death. Isaiah 5 speaks about this in chapter 5, 1 through 5. It says, I will sing for my beloved a song of his vineyard. My beloved had a vineyard, and on a very fertile hill he dug it up, cleared the stones and planted the finest vines. He built a watchtower in the middle and dug out a wine press as well. He waited for the vineyard to yield good grapes, but the fruit it produced was sour. And now, O dwellers of Jerusalem and men of Judah, I exhort you to judge between me and my vineyard. What more could I have done for my vineyard than I already did for it? Why, when I expected, sweet grapes. Did it bring forth sour fruit? Now I tell you what I am about to do to my vineyard. I will take away its hedge, and it will be consumed. I will tear down its wall, and it will be trampled. Verse 7 says, For the vineyard of the Lord of hosts is the house of Israel and the men of Judah, which are the people of God, and they are the plant of his delight. He looked for justice, but saw bloodshed, for the righteousness, but heard a cry of distress. And you can read that there are woes spoken to them after this. And in verse 13 through 15, it says, Therefore my people will go into exile for their lack of understanding. Their dignitaries are starving and their masses are parched down with thirst. 
Therefore, Sheol enlarges its throat and opens wide its enormous jaws, and down go Zion's nobles and masses, her revelers and carousers. So mankind will be brought low and each man humbled. The arrogant will lower their eyes, but the Lord of hosts will be exalted by his justice, and the holy God will show himself holy in righteousness. God lifts up a banner, which is a standard and a rallying point, and whistles for those at the ends of the earth. Behold how speedily and swiftly they come. None of them grows weary or stumbles. No one slumbers or sleeps. No belt is loose and no sandal strap is broken. Jesus warned us in Luke 21, 34 through 36, but watch yourselves or your hearts will be weighed down by dissipation and drunkenness and the worries of life. And that day will spring upon you suddenly like a snare for it will come upon all who dwell on the face of the earth. So keep watch at all times and pray that you have the strength to escape all that is about to happen and to stand before the son of man. Ezekiel 12, 9 through 11 says, So on that day I will set out to destroy all the nations that come against Jerusalem. Then I will pour out on the house of David and on the people of Jerusalem a spirit of grace and prayer, and they will look on me, the one they have pierced. They will mourn for him as one mourns for an only child, and grieve bitterly for him as one grieves for a firstborn son. On that day, the wailing in Jerusalem will be as great as the wailing wailing of Hadad Ramon in the plain of Megiddo. You can say, read in Revelation 1, 7, it says, Behold, he is coming with the clouds, and every eye will see him, even those who pierced him. And all the tribes of the earth will mourn because of him. So it shall be. Amen. Hosea 13 14 says, I will ransom them from the power of Sheol. I will redeem them from death. Where, O death, are your plagues? Where, O Sheol, is your sting? Compassion is hidden from my eyes. Now, we know that death is the last enemy. 1 Corinthians 15, 26 and Revelation 20, 14. 1 Corinthians 15, 50 through 55 says, Now I declare to you, brothers, that flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God, nor does the perishable inherit the imperishable. Listen, I tell you a mystery. We will not all sleep, but we will all be changed in an instant in the twinkling of an eye at the last trumpet. For the trumpet will sound, the dead will be raised imperishable, and we will be changed. For the perishable must be clothed with the imperishable and the mortal with immortality. When the perishable has been clothed with the imperishable and the mortal with immortality, then the saying that is written will come to pass. Death has been swallowed up in victory. Where, O death, is your victory? Where, O death, is your sting? So we've been taught that Jesus came into the world, uh, that when he came into the world, he did not come to condemn it. And that means to judge, to bring to trial, make a determination of right or wrong according to the standard of God. And we read that, and we can read that in John three sixteen and 17. And this is taught to mean as if he will never do this. And this is a a partiality of of what that scripture means and, and what it represents. His purpose in the first coming was to be the suffering servant, the sacrificial lamb, the atoning blood for sin, and to show us how we should live. But he's not going to return that way. He's not returning as the suffering servant, but as the king of kings, and we will all appear before his judgment seat. Acts 10, 42 through 43 speaks about this when it says, And he commanded us to preach to the people and to testify that he is the one appointed by God to judge the living and the dead. 
And again, all the prophets testify about him that everyone who believes in him receives forgiveness of sins through his name. Acts 17, 30 through 31 says, Although God overlooked the ignorance of early times, he now commands all people everywhere to repent. For he has set a day when he will judge the world with justice by the man he has appointed. For he has given proof of this to everyone by raising him from the dead. Well, the word used for condemned in John 3.16 is the same word for judge in these scriptures, testifying to us that Christ will judge us when he returns. The Mosaic Law contains the requirements of what blood needed to be shed in accordance with the offense to God, but the blood of bulls and goats could never take away sin. The sacrifices, offerings, the washings of the body with the, the water mixed with the red heifer, the washing of the clothes, becoming unclean by touching a corpse, or, or something else that was unclean by touching those things, not partaking of certain foods, not wearing clothing of mixed fabric. This is not what God desired. These are works done in the flesh, but have no, in, of, no value of the indulgence of it. What God desires is obedience to his ways and to his precepts. That is confirmed to us in Hebrews 10, 5 through 10, and Psalm 40, 6 through 8. This is the example provided to us through his son, the example in which we are to live by. What man has taught us is that we can toss out the teachings and the concepts of the Mosaic law because of grace, that these were from the law and, and we've been set free from them, so, so they're no longer applicable. Now, the Mosaic law shows us what God considers sin, and it says that all have sinned being slaves to it, and we stand condemned before God. Those, those things provide the protective guidelines for us, for they show us the nature and the character of God. The commandments are holy just and good, as Romans 7.12 tells us. However, they were not followed in faith. Romans 9.30 and 33. And the righteous are to live by faith. Romans 1.7, Galatians 3.11, Habakkuk 2 and 4. So what is faith? Faith is to, to be persuaded. Come to trust. The law was not followed by trust in what God said. They were not persuaded in their hearts that these things were the will of God. So they became a work done in the flesh, done routinely and superficially with indifference in their hearts. It's why it is impossible to please God without faith. You have to be fully convinced trusting in and relying upon what he says in your heart, which is meant to produce the action of obedience to it. You cannot be fully persuaded of something and do the opposite. If you have faith that a bridge is not going to collapse while cars are driving on it, then you drive on the bridge. If you have faith that paper money has value, then you spend it. It's the way it works naturally. We have the warning in Revelation 21, 7 through 8, that the one who overcomes will inherit all things, and I will be his God and he will be my son. But to the cowardly and unbelieving and abominable and murderers and sexually immoral and sorcerers and idolaters and all liars, their place will be in the lake that burns with fire and sulfur. This is the second death. So what is it that we overcome? 1 John 5, 1 through 4 says, Everyone who believes that Jesus is the Christ has been born of God, and everyone who loves the Father also loves those born of him. By this we know we love the children of God, when we love God and we keep 
his commandments. For this is the love of God, that we keep his commandments. And his commandments are not burdensome, because everyone born of God overcomes the world. And this is the victory that has overcome the world, our faith. Hebrews 10, 35 through 38 says, Do not throw away your confidence. It holds great reward. You need to persevere so that after you have done the will of God, you will receive what he has promised. For in just a little while, he who is coming will come and will not delay. But my righteous one will live by faith. And if he shrinks back, I will take no pleasure in him. So what does this shrinking back, this going backwards, this backing off due to compromise look like? Uh, you can read about that in Leviticus 5.15, Leviticus 6.2, Leviticus 26.40. We can see in Numbers 5 that Judah was taken into captivity to Babylon. I'm sorry, that's out of 1 Chronicles 9.1. Uh, Numbers 5 was another thing you can go read about. Saul died because of, of this falling backward. 1 Chronicles 10.13. Ahaz encouraged moral decline, and the Lord was angry with him. 2 Chronicles 28. Ezra 9 talks about the exiles who repented of their unfaithfulness. Ezekiel shows us that when a nation persists in unfaithfulness to the Lord, that famine is a surety and it will become a desolation. In 14, 13, and 15, 8. Daniel says that shame belongs to all the inhabitants of Israel for its unfaithfulness. Daniel 9, 7. Ezekiel 18, 24 says, But if a righteous man turns from his righteousness and practices iniquity, committing the same abominations as the wicked, will he live? None of the righteous acts which he did will be remembered because of the unfaithfulness and sin he has committed. He will die. 1 Corinthians 10, 1 through 12 tells us, I do not want you to be unaware, brothers, that our forefathers were all under the cloud, and that they all passed through the sea. They were all baptized into Moses in the cloud and in the sea. They all ate the same spiritual food and drank the same spiritual drink, for they drank from the spiritual rock that accompanied them, and that rock was Christ. Nevertheless, God was not pleased with most of them, for they were struck down in the wilderness. These things took place as examples to keep us from craving evil things as they did. Do not be idolaters as some of them were. As it is written, the people sat down to eat and to drink and got up to indulge in revelry. We should not commit sexual immorality as some of them did, and in one day, 23,000 of them died. We should not test Christ as some of them did and were killed by snakes, and do not complain as some of them did and were killed by the destroying angel. Now these things happened to them as examples and were written down as warnings for us on whom the fulfillment of the ages has come. So the one who thinks he is standing firm should be careful not to fall. True obedience has been made a doctrine of works by the teaching of men. Some even go as far as to say that it's the devil that reminds us of the law, and it's a, as a way to make us feel condemned. The teachings in the Old Testament of being unclean and defiled, unrighteous mixing, washings, they were to teach them God's views on the things and to serve as a reminder to them how to distinguish between right and wrong. The true application of them is found in the New Testament 
but we have not understood this because we're told that they no longer apply, and thereby circumventing the Holy Spirit's ability to convince us with his solid, compelling evidence to prove us wrong because it doesn't make us feel good about ourselves. But where did Jesus say he came to make us feel good? Nowhere. The concept of not wearing mixed fabric correlates to unrighteous mixing as taught in 2 Corinthians 6, 14 through 18. The washings of the body correlates to being washed with the water of the word in 1 Corinthians 6, 11 and Ephesians 5, 26. If a person did certain things like not being circumcised, Compound, compounding the Lord's incense for common uses, sexual perversion and sin. It was, it was considered despising the word of the Lord, and they were to be cut off from among the people. You can read that in Genesis 7, 14, Exodus 30, 33 through 38, Leviticus 7, 25 through 27, Leviticus 20, and Numbers 15, 31. We understand that circumcision is supposed to be of the heart, Romans 2.29. It is the putting off of our sinful nature, Colossians 2.11. Incense has become the prayers of the people, Revelation 5.8 and 8.3. Sexual sin is still prohibited, 1 Corinthians 6.18. But truly, it is adultery towards God. And we are commanded to love the Lord with all our heart, soul, and mind. Matthew twenty two thirty seven, 37, Deuteronomy 6, 5, and Deuteronomy 10, 12. To worship and serve no other God at the same level as or above him. Worship and service is not about singing songs. It is about your lifestyle and what you pattern your way of living around. It is your faith. Those that follow Islam or New Age, various cults, all these people, their lives are conformed around their beliefs and they serve Baal. Think about the priests who served the people in the temple in their service to God. They assisted with the sacrifice, keeping themselves holy at all times during their service. The disciples understood these concepts, and this is why Paul wrote in Romans 12, 1, Therefore I urge you, brothers, on account of God's mercy, to offer your body as a living sacrifice holy and pleasing to God, which is your spiritual service of worship. How you live your life is worship. So if we're going to serve no other God, we have to conform our lives to the way that God has laid out for us in his word. Jesus brought the grace of God, the gift of salvation. He rescues us from the destruction and the brings into divine safety. He delivers us out of the danger and the penalty and power of sin because that's what he does. He saves us from our sin and its slavery. We cannot earn this gift because God, who is rich in mercy and because of the love that he loves us with, he gave us this gift while we were dead and falling away and deviating from the truth of his ways into error. This is the grace spoken of by the prophets, the promise of the new covenant. And once we come to the understanding of our sin, we are to turn from it changing our minds about the way we live and conforming our thoughts and actions to line up with the word of God, living in obedience to his word because we are fully persuaded that they are his will, which is our faith. And if after we have escaped the world, the bondage of sin through the knowledge of Christ only to turn around and become entangled and twisted up with sin once again and brought back under its bondage, becoming its slave once again, 
we have trampled Christ and counted his blood that was shed for us as a common thing when he came to save us from our sin. So there is therefore no further sacrifice for that sin. It's like saying you can go sin and just sacrifice a lamb and it's all fine with God, which is exactly what the people of God did in the examples provided it to us in the Old Testament. And we don't heed those examples. If the teaching of radical grace is true and that God will never be angry with us no matter what we do, how badly we mess up, then where is it taught by the prophets? This idea is not what the disciples believed or taught, but it does appeal to our feelings and the desires to follow the dictates of our own hearts, allowing us to throw off restraint and indulge our flesh. This should be a red flag to us that this is a false teaching from 2 Peter 2. Ephesians 4, 21 through 23 says, Surely you have heard of him and were taught in him, in keeping with the truth that is in Jesus, to put off your former way of life, your old self, which is being corrupted by its deceitful desires, to be renewed in the spirit of your minds, and to put on the new self, created to be like God in true holiness and righteousness. Therefore, each of you must put off falsehood and speak truthfully with his neighbor, for we are all members of one another. Be angry, yet do not sin. Do not let the sun go down upon your anger, and do not give the devil a foothold. He who has been stealing must steal no more, but must work doing good with his hands, that he may have something to share with the one in need. Let no unwholesome talk come out of your mouths, but only what is helpful for building up the one in need and bringing grace to those who listen. And do not grieve the Holy Spirit of God in whom you were sealed for the day of redemption. Isaiah spoke about this in 63, 8 through 10, when he said, For he said, They are surely my people, sons who will not be disloyal. So he became their savior. In all their distress, he was afflicted too, and the angel of his presence saved them. In his love and in compassion, he redeemed them. He lifted them up and carried them all the days of old. But they rebelled and grieved his Holy Spirit. So he turned and became their enemy, and he himself fought against them. Folks, we are no different from those people. Colossians 3, 5 through 10 says, Put to death, therefore, the components of your earthly nature, sexual immorality, impurity, lust, evil desires, and greed, which is idolatry. Because of these, the wrath of God is coming on the sons of disobedience. When you lived among them, you used to walk in these ways, but now you are to put off these things. Anger, rage, malice, slander, foul language out of your mouth. Do not lie to one another since you have taken off the old self with its practices and have put on the new self, which is being renewed in the knowledge in the image of its creator. You can go read about that in Psalm 78, Micah 5, and Jeremiah 9. But I I didn't list them out because they're way too long to include here. James 1, 21 through 25 says, Therefore, get rid of all moral filth and every expression of evil, and humbly accept the word planted in you which can save your souls. Be doers of the word and not hearers only. Otherwise, you are deceiving yourself. For anyone who hears the word but does not carry it out is like a man who looks at his face in a mirror and after observing himself goes away and immediately forgets what he looks like. But the one who looks intently into the perfect law of freedom and continues to do so, not being a forgetful hearer but an effective doer, he will be blessed in what he does. Because this person is persuaded that God's word is true 
his commandments, holy, just, and true. They are God's will for our lives. So that person patterns his life to line up with them. Then he will be blessed. All of these things perfectly align with what the prophets spoke. And I pray that we will take ourselves before the Father, who is ready to pardon us if we will turn from our sin, forsake our old way of living, and line our lives up with his word. Oh, let us repent, for the kingdom of God is at hand. Be blessed, my brothers and sisters. Please take this all to the Lord in prayer for consideration.